So we have experts, and our right round table consists of three parts. Every part will take us about 30 minutes. In first part, Professor Eisner Ross will finish the description of his research. He started in during plenary session, and uh, he will finish that. Then, next, uh, the next So first of all, the difference with the other constructed in the case of the Americans as being different to diet. These groups of others are not static. These can contingently as the context of the discussion change. And then as to this, I think it helps us see how young people construct their own identities. Because when they are constructed in one way, there are different others than when they constructed in a different way. So there's a more focused part of our discussion in each group. Often when I ask them um, about the potential expansion of the European Union, what additional countries might or might not be allowed to join? And I would give them a short list, um, usually of countries um, to the east, um, to the border of that particular country, and sometimes Turkey as well. So I'd use Russia, sometimes Belarus, sometimes Ukraine, sometimes Serbia, and, and uh, often Turkey. And as I showed also this morning, the discussion of this often sharpened the descriptions of the characteristics of the European Union. But also, as I now show, uh, allowed debate about what constituted the national and the European Union. <coughs> And in this process also, there were references to what might be called internal others, residents of the country who were not considered part of that society. In this case, this particular four countries, this often particularly centered on the Roma communities. There was sometimes some difficulty in conceptualizing differences with others, a reticence to make comparative judgments. The borders of Europe are sometimes mentioned as being the Urals, and the Bosphorus. But when individual countries were discussed, the criteria became more specific. So to start with Russia. Russia, as a potential European Union member, was objected to on several counts. First of all, Russia wasn't seeking or would not seek to join or would not benefit from joining. They wouldn't even want to be in Europe. They're big, they can look after themselves, said Duncan. Secondly, it was argued that Russia, compared to the other European Union members, was too powerful, military, economically, or both, to be a partner in the Union. They would misuse this power in pursuit of their own interests. Fear of Russian power was frequently expressed. Uh, they're very violent, they have lots of money, a lot of weapons. And the equilibrium of power in the Union would be threatened by this, in Rudolf's view, uh, if Russia joins, then the balance will be turned over. There would no longer be a union, but something different. Countries were concerned about being dominated. I'm not sure if they can fit into the European Union, uh, said Clementia. And this potential instability worried others. Russia is a totalitarian country, said one. There were geographical concerns. One said, a smaller part of Russia is in Europe. I don't know if we should accept the whole country or only the part that's in Europe. 
Underlying many arguments were apprehensions about historical relationships between Russia, as the Soviet Union, and these four countries. In the Czech Republic, uh, Dunsa said, Russia occupied many other states, we were occupied by the Soviets. Kato said, we got rid of them 20 years ago, and I don't want them back again. And it was the young Polish people, particularly, who most vehemently protested against the idea of Russian membership. We had too many events in the past connected with Russia. We need to remember that Russia is a threat. Another advanced reason, other, other reasons are advanced against Russian membership, although they never agree to the loss of sovereignty that membership would require. However, not all opinions were for against. There were also expressions of conditional support. But Russia would have to accommodate to certain regulations to enter the Union and had to meet European Union's terms. A few suggested benefits from Russian membership, but for others, Russian membership, membership of other countries like Belarus and Ukraine, was simply a matter of equity and right. Why shouldn't they join? Turn to Belarus. There were similar debates about potential Belarus membership. The strongest objections were political, and came from the Polish young people who lived closest to Belarus in Bialystok. Russia isn't an American country, said Gozi. And Piotr said, more specifically, I think Belarus is a bad idea while Yushchenko, Lukashenko is the president. I don't like him, and I don't want him in Europe. Others argued that Belarus had no need to join. That's not enough for themselves. Um, or that they needed to be cultural changes. Membership, though, was supported on the grounds of geography or because it would help Belarusians. The Ukraine presented more complex discussions. The political arguments here had both a comparative and a historical dimension. Rostov in Warsaw said, I don't really like the Ukraine. I don't want to help it. The Ukraine only acts on Russia's orders. And in that same group, Jeremy agreed and accepted this. Most Poles have a negative attitude towards Ukraine. It stems from the 40s, when what happened in Southeastern Republic. There were also economic arguments from Germany that Ukraine would become a threat to our economy. Others were more cautious and conditional. The comparisons with Russia were often used in favor of Ukrainian membership. Ukraine could be, it has a European culture, but the Russians These discussions of Russia, Belarus, and the Ukraine uh, largely compared these countries to specific Visegrad countries. As Pantyev said, the Ukrainians, the Belarusians, the Russians are all Slavic people, like we are, but we are more adaptive. We have to take on the culture of the West. So they were comparing these Eastern European countries with themselves as members of their own country rather than as Europeans. The question of Turkish potential membership often had a very different tone. <coughs> the comparator here became us Europeans. And in Preshov, we had an interesting conversation. Camilla asked her group, but wouldn't you say Turks are different from us Europeans, provoking this discussion? They're quite different. Maybe they have some common customs, but they're very different from us. Well, doesn't suit me. I don't think they're Europeans. So they were often being described as not European rather than not Ukrainian, not, not uh, Polish, or not Slovak, or not uh, Hungarian. I don't think they're Europeans, said Dominic. They're not so much Europeans, they rather belong to the Middle East. And they've got a different skin color. I don't think they're the Europeans like we are. So why was Turkey seen in this rather different way? One set of reasons was geographical, because of distance. The Bosphorus, um, and they're a long way away. But cultural difference was a more significant factor. Turkey isn't a European country. It has a different culture. It's a different country. This is Lusitia in Hungary. Most young people had used culture as a distinguishing factor in identifying their own country, rather than the political aspect of their country. But now they use it to 
distinguished Europe. Turkey is a totally different culture to the culture of European countries. We would have such a weird, weird diversity of cultures in Poland, it wouldn't be natural. So they're using Europe now, which they have previously considered as a political entity, instead of arrangements that have to do with democracy, to do with travel, to do with studying abroad, and so on, in a cultural way now to compare it to the Turks. And culture in this context has got a particular connotation. There are some bad things in Turkey, said the And what many of them meant was religious difference. <coughs> many constructed Turkey as essentially Islamic. I'd say Turkey is more Arabic. Islam prevails. And consequently, Turkey is thinking about morality, the Muslims and the culture, the changes of culture. Islam was constructed as being oppositional to Christianity. These are the two most influential religions, and one does not agree with the other. In Turkey, you have people who will kill for their faith. In Europe, they will encounter a different religion. Islam was seen by some of them, certainly, as potentially violent. They assumed that Turks would wish to force Islam on Europe. Rostislava suggested that Turkey would like people to wear scars on their faces, and we wouldn't like to do that. Turmas is a lot of force. The aggressive Muslims, they can conquer and fight for their rights of their religion. There are a number of myths about Islam and Turkey. These range from questions of worship to more bizarre prejudices. One of them say everyone wears scars on their face and they stone people to death. Turkish membership of Europe might also introduce fresh political problems. There were, however, some voices in favour of Turkish membership. As elsewhere, equitable treatment for all will be applicants was upheld. It's discrimination in stopping them being in the European Union. If they need help with jobs, why don't we support them? Uh, several state cultural differences were exaggerated. It's just their customs and habits. They have these habits, scars. It's nothing special. And yet others argued that far from being the other, Turks had much in terms of shared history with other Europeans. And there are others who argue that the Turkish membership on what we might be termed geopolitical grounds, the whole continent, including Turkey, should unite against possible Russian aggression, once again in Europe. So in these processes of othering countries, we get illumination of some of the ways in which national and European identities are constructed. Now, remember, uh, national, in the, in the four visiting countries, the country is largely seen as cultural and institutions are significant. And Europe, the European Union, was seen as institutional and a common culture was the problem. When we look at Eastern Europe, and we think of that in other, if the country is contrasted institutionally as <coughs> being different from Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine, and issues of cultural difference with those countries are not raised so much. But when we turn to Turkey, it's Europe that becomes what's contrasted, not the country. And Europe is culturally different from Turkey, and institutional differences are not raised so much. So I think it's quite an interesting um, way in which we can see them constructing Europe, their own country, and also contrasting Europe in their own country with rather different parameters than they do the country in Europe. So, there were one or two others who were other as well. Um, other groups of other included um, migrants and Muslims who were seen as different in some way. Sometimes they were treated as being the same group. Um, and they want to change Europe in some way. Um, they want to change our population. They should accept our culture. There was any masks that don't agree with that. They were Roma in all four countries, and they were raised, in some cases, as being problematic. They're less Hungarians in one. They're living for free. Um, there was also some very positive comments from some of the Polish people I spoke to. Um, other outsiders, for some, were German, 
Germans, Romanians, Serbians, and there are also evidence of outsiders based on stereotypes. Um, in Africa, they're all cannibals, so it might. And occasionally, there are other women within the Visegrad countries themselves. I want to turn now to the way in which they other parents and grandparents, generational differences. I hinted at this earlier this morning. Um, after each group had talked about themselves and their own identity, they were asked to discuss if they felt that this might in some sense be different from the way that they thought that their parents or grandparents felt. So the discussions were not about their parents or grandparents' own constructions of identity, but of the young people's conceptions of those constructions. Another opportunity to discuss similarity and difference and possibly to distinguish similarities and differences. The initial reaction of most of them was to deny that there was any difference between themselves and their parents. They thought, they said, that it was the same as their parents was. What we are like is what our parents have taught us. This is how identity and mentality has changed. And this embraced both national identity, they took to think about Hungary, so I feel Hungarian, and our parents taught us how to behave, so we behave like our parents are similar same culture and behavior that they give us. However, this was just an initial reaction. As they talked, they began to, began, began to reflect more. Seraphim in Poland explained that this way, we are similar to our parents, but we're not the same. We don't agree with our parents. We would have like to have our own views on certain matters. I think that older people remember more how it was back in the old days. So what? They remember the troubles of everyday life. Um, others were more specific. It's not about our parents, because they are not old enough to remember the times of communism. But our grandparents, they have greater experience of a tougher time. Uh, or people who are. People who are older may have different ideas, over 60. They've survived a lot of things. So the period of communism and Soviet domination was discussed with both parents and grandparents. The references are sometimes specific to the Soviet Union or Russia. Um, Father, hungry speaks of the earlier times, my grandparents, when there were Russian domination here. They were really hard times, they told me. They had to hide away that they were Hungarian. And other times, the references are to the periods of communism or socialism. But here's an interesting exchange from some of Slovakians. The Viga doesn't know what it's called. What do you think? What's it called? It's called, you mean socialism? No, no, no. Same thing. Everyone had to wear the same. You couldn't travel abroad. What's it called? Communism? Yeah, that's it. Communism. Everything was the same. It was terrible. And I think it's quite interesting that those terms, communism and socialism, are not necessarily part of the common vocabulary, and she has to actually do some checking with her colleagues, her, her friends, about what the words actually mean, reminding her. Um, the, the effect of this period on their parents and grandparents are described in three ways. On their lives and behavior, on their instruction of identity, and on their behavior now. So parents and grandparents uh, had to learn Russian at school. They didn't like Russian language in the Russian language. They also put less material goods didn't have so many things as we have now, televisions and computers. My mum didn't have her own clothes. She wore clothes of her sister. And the young people also suggested, uh, much more, that living through these times had affected how their parents saw their, their identity. I think they're more proud of it than we are because of the wars in the 50s, because they fought for it, they appreciated it more. My parents think that being Hungarian it's like being awarded something. They like Hungary so much. And this was something that they felt that their own generation of young people lacked. In my parents, there's a stronger sense of being Hungarianness. But I don't think the young people of my age all share the same opinion. They also suggested that this has affected other aspects of the behavior. Their parents were closed to new things. When I say not to go to America, they say it's so far, you have to stay here in Hungary. For others, it marks their views about Russia. My mum 
reality. It's a terrible time. It's a Russia. It's not a complete free, free, free country. Maybe my mum is afraid that the past will come again, maybe. Others appear also to wish that the old regime would return. As a consequence of these perceptions of different in their parents, some young people appear to create the older generation as being the other. Here's an example. Our parents are so much older than us and live most of their lives in totally different times, in a totally different system. And this is what shaped their views, because patriotism was conceived of in a totally different way at that time. Nowadays, well, what could patriotism mean to young people? To me, personally, nothing. So some of the grandparents had views, had memories, not just of the communist period, but also of the Second World War. Um, and as with parents, in most cases, these experiences enhanced feelings of national identity. Probably we are proud to be managed to survive this. We gain strong resonation because we are. We should be proud to manage to survive. Some young people felt that they had heard too much of their grandparents. Sometimes my grandmother starts to talk about the war, and I just sit there and listen. It's the thousandth time I've heard it. What's striking in these accounts is the construction of a difference from the older generations. Sometimes it was the sense of loss. Now we don't feel the necessity of solidarity so much. It's a different thing to go through than to just listen to it. Such experiences go under your skin. Gossier's account here is full of references to grandparents and parents as being they, and to her general own generation as being we. I think maybe when our parents, when our grandparents, feel the most Polish, because they and their parents were fighting for the Poland in the wars. My grandma and grandfather tell me about the wars, and how they lived, how it was hard, and how Russians came to my grandfather's house and stole everything. I think because of those moments in history, they feel the most Polish. Our parents also feel because they were born in this hard for both the time. They don't become as we had a really easier life. We can't really understand how hard it was for these people. Differences can be identified across a range of attitudes and beliefs. Grandparents more prejudiced against Russians and Germans. We're thinking in different ways. The older generation remember these wars. They know the stereotypes. You know, to put it more succinctly. They have a kind of trauma for them. But suddenly Germans will start to come and they will start killing. I don't know how to describe it, but I think they're still afraid of the unknown. Something dangerous may happen. That was your answer. Talking about her grandma, how she had apprehensions about talking to her grandma because of these kind of things coming up that she couldn't <coughs> She had German friends that she didn't dare tell her grandma about. I can see they're different. We're interested in the future. Other ways in which the older generation is different include physical and economic ways. Older generations were sometimes seen as fearful. My grandparents and parents are scared about everything about me, about themselves, and new things. They're closed to new ideas. As younger people, we are open to new things, to people, to new information. There are also differences, difficulties in communicating with older generations. Krakow, Granta says, with our grandparents it's difficult to talk because they've had traumatic experiences. And they don't like to talk about Russia or Germany. You know, easy to say something wrong, and they'll be angry. Garcia, I don't talk to my grandparents because they have very strong opinions. It's difficult to talk. Sometimes also parents are difficult to talk to. I try to talk right with my father. He doesn't like to talk about the time that he was young. He always says he was born at the age of 30. Finally, many young people describe their generation as being different and different values to their parents and grandparents. Now, everyone has a different lifestyle, and parents frequently disagree with our lifestyles. So, particularly significant <coughs> values, particularly in Poland, was about religious expression. Whether Catholic or not, the sentiment was religion doesn't matter so much to the younger generation. You can't see people being really religious, concerned with religion. And I think this is the influence of the West, because 
cosmopolitanism, because in this generation are homophobia and euthanasia. If there is a cross mentioned before in Krakow, brought this to a head. The older generation very quickly the monument there, the younger generation is to have fun to watch the whole affair and watch what happened. So two singular and multiple identities. <clears throat> Much of the foregoing analysis demonstrated that individual young people are able to exhibit several identities at the same time, <clears throat> while others find it more problematic. And finally, I'm going to summarize the evidence given about singular and multiple identities. Given the focus of the discussion groups, it's not surprising that there are many complex and sometimes contradictory accounts of multiple and singular identities. There were put forward. A minority of young people spoke, so to say, that they had a singular national identity. That many qualified this with the degrees of Europeans, the weight of being European, the weight of Polish, uh, or Czech, varying um, according to contingent terms. A few of them said they had a singular European identity. I'm European, I'm not Polish. Um, and some of them said that they didn't was global. There were also those of mixed national origins, some of whom described themselves in terms of their town, or their region, or Slavs, or of religion. Some of them gave hierarchies of identities. So to run through those, um, those who felt that they were semi nationals of their own country, some of them had a simple statement. Whole, I'm protecting my country, a patriot. But more frequently explained this with reference to the potentiality of Europe. Ulrich said, I feel I'm a citizen of the Czech Republic. Another person of the Czech Republic, and I feel a citizen of Europe. I'm another person who feels a citizen of the whole world. But formally, each is a member of one community, and it's more important to me to be Polish, to be Czech, sorry. Not infrequently, this insertion of national identity was expressed as rejection of potential European identity. No, I don't think I'm European. I always feel this inferiority conflict whenever I'm abroad. Rejecting in Europe here is total bullshit, but if anything, if I say I'm European, I imagine the map, the continent. Matched by Katja here, it's Slovakia. Uh, there's no such sense of Europeanness in Slovakia. Maybe other countries, but not in Slovakia. The majority of young people who expressed this on this, though, said that they had a mixture of European and national identities. Some said they said they felt more European, uh, and more national than European. I feel more Slovakian than European, says uh, Teresa. More often, though, there's an explanation. Capture says, when I say Hungarian, it's the same as saying I'm European, because Hungary's part of Europe. I feel more Hungarian than European. It's something to express as a question of being in a particular situation. Joseph, I'm more Hungarian than European. We're part of the European Union, but not melted into the Union. So to the extent of other countries, we still stand out. About as many people, young people said they felt more European than nationals. Sometimes they couldn't explain this. Uh, for others, there was a feeling that being European was in some way better. Claudia here says it's more prestigious to say I'm European than a Slovak. But to many others, um, being more European was part of their assertion of a generational identity. Patricia here sums this up. For young people now, it isn't very important to be Polish. We'd rather say we're West European Union. And Beatrice, the younger generation feel more and more European than the older generation. We live in one Europe. And cultural differences are blending. <coughs> so just says, these cultural differences are blending. These people stop identifying themselves with one country. I feel more European than Polish. I can't define them. But the values of the European Union are definitely different to those of America. Few young people profess themselves to be equally national and European. Lucia here, I think I'm European, but Hungarian too. I think I'm European, they're not comparable. No, they're not comparable. They're not comparable. comparable. To Ishak, to be Hungarian, to be part of the European entity. Two Vietnamese origin Hungarian born young people were explicit about their dual nationality, their dual identity. I'd like to go back to Vietnam, but I do feel European. Or Yanni, I feel European because I live here. 
In culture, I feel like Asia, I'm Asian. It's half and half. A few young people seem to be very largely of wholly European. Alicia explains this sense of her being known in a very interesting way. Everywhere you go, you're surrounded by your friends, people from the same group, natives. They don't know you, but they know you. You're like a distant relative. In my opinion, being European means that everywhere you have neighbours. And this it reflects the way in which Benedict Anderson talks about nations as being major communities. Benedict Anderson wrote this, this important book on nationalism about uh, 20 years ago, um, in which he described nations as being imagined. And here you can see um, uh, Alicia talking about Europe in precisely the same way that Benedict Anderson says people talk about them. This European identity was quite often expressed in terms of contingency. Being European was useful if you came from a small, potentially unknown country. If I say I'm Slovak, many people don't know about Slovakia. But if I say I'm European, it's widely known. There's a greater value at the communion. Abroad, I say I'm from the Czech Republic. It'd be a miracle if it was Austria. Outside of Europe, I say I'm European. And a few young people asserted they were neither exclusively nationals or Europeans, but were global citizens. You must explain this particularly to reject the extreme national, nationals in Hungary. I'm not a Magyakoto. I just feel I live in the world. I'm convinced of being Hungarian, <coughs> being European. I just live in the world. From us, I'm just a citizen of the world, just in Europe. Those who had origins of more than one country seemed mostly to enjoy the diversity of their heritage and their liminality. Some family members have migrated to other countries, and their descendants have become in some ways any in the country of origin. And finally, there were identities other than the national and European. A civic identity was not uncommon, and there were regional identities and expressions of Slavic identity. These multiple identities were sometimes expressed as hierarchy. Hierarchies of size, that's an issue. I am now from Krakow. This is most important. It's my little homeland. Next is Matopolska. And then the whole of them. I'm Polish, I come from Poland. So, and it is given there a hierarchy of size. And Matiewicz from Ostrava is even more explicit about this. Coming from the smallest one, the town of Austin, Austin region of Romania, Missouri, Poland, and maybe Europe as well. In this direction and in this order. So, to some conclusions. These examples suggest that most people describe identities as being multiple, explicitly recognizing and acknowledging this. The spectrum of the ease in which they could do this, the minority saw themselves as being the dominant priorities, largely to one particular town or region or country, but most of them were more fluid in their attachments, accepting multiplicity. Many were able to express themselves, express the situation in which they found themselves, um, and they used one entity rather than the other. They also distinguished themselves from their parents, and more, more specifically their grandparents. The older generations were locked into national entities for a variety of different reasons the young people are thinking about. This doesn't mean that the old people did feel this way. The significance is that the, the young people chose to construct the belief of their elders and to differentiate themselves from previous generations. And the primary reason advanced by young people for the generational difference is that parents and grandparents have been socialized when young into different political societies, <coughs> radically different from today. Situations of war, occupation, invasion, suppression, deprivation, and denial of national identity. And this led, they say, in their parents and grandparents, to expressions of feelings of solidarity based on national linguistic and cultural ties, and the expressions of it is affiliated to the country of the nation. These young people, all born in the mid-1990s, admitted that they had very different experiences, many of which, of them suggested, explained their different expressions of identity. Again, this doesn't necessarily mean that this was the reason. The significance is that the young people said that they believed this to be the cause, and provided it in the construction identity and solidarity of their age cohort. It does provide an interesting 
parallel to the recent work of Mary Fallbrook, who analyzed generational differences in the construction of German political ideologies in the 20th century. And she argues the age at which people experience key historical moments, such as transitions in German society in 1923, 1945, and 1989, can be critical explanatory factors behind an individual or a group's availability of mobilization. Generation in this study have not lived through these particular key events. Their parents have done so. The key event in these young people's lives was the country's accession to the European Union in 2004, an event of a very different type. The earlier part of their lives have been spent in a brief period of total national sovereignty. The latter part in a situation where this independence had been voluntarily surrendered to a larger confederation, the European Union. And it's in this context that we see their construction of their countries as being largely cultural phenomena, still hugely significant in most of their lives. And the country's political institutions as being less of significance, quaint, inept, of a different generation. The institutional structures in which they see their futures playing out are through the possibilities of their own freedom of movement to study, to work, and live within the European Union. The adherence to economic prosperity, democracy and peace brought about by the Union. But the Union generally lacks a cultural presence in these young people's lives. Cultural horizons are to a large extent, not exclusively, at the country level. Language, history, food, tradition. Europe becomes a cultural phenomenon only when exposed to the other, whether the other is American or the Muslim East. So <coughs> that's as far as I've got so far. I'm, I'm still pursuing this project. I'm doing field work in Iceland next week, and uh, um, I'm expanding my horizons the whole time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you guys so very much. Are we going to stay with this table? Yeah, absolutely. You take it. Okay, so you're sitting here. Okay, thank you very much. We have uh, one extra microphone, so maybe Elena, I would like to... Oh, you have, you have a microphone. Okay. So thank you very much. I will start, let's start the discussion on this, uh, on this uh, uh, research. Now we start the second part of our round table when I give a floor to our uh, experts from country and external expert. Uh, three questions are prepared for every of you. The first question I would like to ask every of you and ask you for just two minutes of um, answer. The question is, what do you believe is the significant result of these findings from your country perspective? Two minutes for every expert. Let's start from Slovakia. I don't feel very much to be an expert in this field. I only had a privilege for some, for some years uh, to collaborate with Professor Ross, and uh, which data I consider as a significant. I um, noticed uh, expression uh, from Slovak students that uh, they consider uh, this nationality, Slovak people, to be different from other Russian grand, uh, countries, so that the people are more calm and less ambitious, which was uh, surprising how they could express this one, but at the same time. Because uh, every generation thinks that 
their parents and grandparents are much more closer and not open-minded and, uh, and some uh, tradis more traditional and uh, I think uh, they uh, mix the really differences between the general uh, intergenerational differences which is uh, very important to be um, uh, own identity, to construct own identity that I, I can uh, realize the differences between our parents and students and I think it is a special uh, age connection. This finding is uh, related to their age, not only that really uh, thinking the European identities. I think there is not as much differences that they so that they thought. Yes. Thank you very much, Eva. And uh, Roland, Dorota? Uh, well, I like to say that uh, when we are talking about the uh, significant uh, effect of the study, I think that uh, uh, very important is uh, to this part of the study where the young people uh, could tell about their national identity and European identity. And there is, a, this, this, uh, there is a significant difference in understanding the term identity in, in such a situation. So uh, identity uh, in a national context has a completely different discourse that identity in European context. Uh, European identity, uh, in Polish case, uh, is understood as a specific style of life, individual choice of someone. Uh, the national identity uh, is understood through the collective processes based, first of all, on ethnicity, uh, framed in this uh, 19th century national tradition. Uh, where the students were talking about the European identity, they described the possibility for study, travel and work in Europe in the future. When they were talking about the national identity, they called frightness, for example, of being a member of the group. They suffered from the group stereotypes of Polish people in Europe. The individual victory of someone, for example, in sport, music, on dan or dancing, uh, is treated as a collective winning. We won this championship. Uh, we won the championship of uh, Chopin, for example. Uh, <coughs> the uh, regional teaching has a national mark, has a national interpretation. Exclude other, the same dish if we want call them Polish dish, we exclude the same dish and say that it is not a Czech uh, kitchen. Sometimes it's, it's the same dish. Uh, for the uh, national identity, uh, first, uh, the national identity arises around the symbols and the individual can, can join the symbols. Uh, where the, uh, It's, uh, um, I can say, kind of external identity. The young can join the symbols or be a part of the symbols. This is the way they think uh, through, the, through the data. Thank you, Dorota. And uh, Czech Republic, Well, talking about the significant points of uh, this study, uh, of course, uh, I would like to talk about several uh, levels. The first one, just the general uh, level, it means there are uh, different well-known conceptions, uh, sorry, uh, uh, concepts of uh, citizenship uh, accepted by the uh, scientists and uh, conceptions of uh, identity, for example, Marshall, as well, the students, and etc., etc. Et and usually they are based on the reflection of current reality, but they influence the political strategies as uh, well, and in this way they influence, they impact our lives. The development of uh, citizenship and European identity in the sense of uh, 
the law will be listed from motion is both uh, intentionally regulated and uh, spontaneously running process. Uh, the findings of this study reflect the state of understanding of identity or identities by young people and to make sure so-called the weak points which uh, we as an uh, educator should try to overcome. I mean, uh, for example, stereotypes, prejudices, and so on and so on. And in my opinion, the most uh, significant uh, impact of this study is the option to uh, compare the national outcomes due to which we are able to define national uh, specifics and general traits uh, common for understanding of European identity and consequently European citizenship. Talking about the understanding of identity about Czech, uh, Czech youngers, I'd like to say that uh, they have rather high level of self-estimation. Yeah, maybe of course that's uh, a good uh, beginning for uh, their lives. Yeah, <coughs> but they don't suffer for some uh, uh, inferiority, so-called uh, called inferiority uh, complexes. But at the same time, of course, the understanding of identity is primarily culturally rooted. Yeah. It means uh, the understanding of uh, European identity uh, generally uh, uh, connected with some, the understanding of some official institutions at one level, and just uh, the uh, uh, attitude determined by their ages that they are young and they want to travel and they want uh, to find found something like uh, like that. Yeah. But understanding of national identity is in superior and they understand it primarily as a cultural phenomenon. Yeah. Thank you very much, Elena. And external experts, Sveta, what's your opinion about the Thank most you. significant point? I'm coming from Ljubljana, Slovenia, and I was not looking for specific national answers. I was looking for some general trends. And I must say that uh, the most significant findings I see this, as Alistair already uh, stressed, that young people, as they see Europe or European Union on this common institutional level, but national identity on cultural and uh, this national uh, specific level. Uh, and they are also very consistent in this part of their, answer, their answers. Uh, they, the same trend can be noticed when they are discussing about enthusiasm and uncertainty concerning EU. Uh, I'm citing one expression. They, are, uh, they feel enthusiasm for EU institutions but uncertainty about the conception of common culture. So they, are, they stress the importance of preserving their national identity through culture, through, through language, even dishes, uh, and of course, sport. They also do not see limits of their own nationality uh, it, they can communicate with all others. They are thinking not of others, not in their national characteristics, but they say, again, this is a situation, the main point is not the nationality. When you are clever, want to excel, you can do it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's really interesting. So, uh, uh, next question, which uh, was the prepared, is longer, so let me to read it. Young people expressed various kinds of understanding of what their country and European identity means to them. Are there particular aspects of this that you think are missing from their accounts, or aspects that you are surprised to see mentioned? Let's start from Paula. And that's, that I, I ask you for giving time. 
Yeah, okay. Two minutes. Uh, I try to get. This is the continuation of the uh, of my thesis from the from the previous. Uh, in my opinion, according to that, the data in children's mind arise ambivalent feelings uh, according to construction national identity. Uh, for one side, they respect and follow this nationalistic pattern to the cultural identity, but they are very sensitive toward uh, behavior going after those feelings. And when they see their parents who declare patriotic attitudes but don't behave uh, as patriots as they teach their children, uh, the children has a very uh, deeply identity problems. From the other side, uh, the uh, European, in the case of European identity, the category me and others uh, um, uh, is much more clear, much more flexible, and uh, from one side, the youngsters admire unification of style of life. They like uh, this change in concept of identity between the generation. They like to be European, but from the other side, they are afraid about the situation that there is no difference. So that what happens to me as a cultural feature. Thank you very much, Chilena, Czech Republic. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, the general statement is uh, uh, identity is a result of interacting with uh, surrounding. But at the same time, uh, talking about uh, the understanding of identity by uh, Czech students, I was surprised uh, that uh, uh, the project survey ran uh, around in uh, two uh, cities, in Ostrava and in uh, Radetzkravo. Uh, Ostrava, uh, just for foreigners, uh, uh, is an administrative uh, center of uh, the North um, uh, Moravia. Uh, um, the city is located near the border area, near the Poland, uh, the border with Poland and Slovakia. And, uh, there are uh, big uh, majorities of uh, Poles and Slovak in this uh, uh, region. At the same time, uh, students uh, uh, didn't reflect the phenomena of multicultural uh, uh, multicultural reality of the uh, region. And their identities were um, uh, reflected as monocultural one. Uh, this is one uh, of my um, of uh, my opinion. Part of my opinion, and the second one is um, one of the group was the students of uh, conservatory. Uh, they are the future musicians and dancers. So we know the uh, tourism, in fact, that art uh, doesn't know borders and breaks the borders. It means they are expected to be a cosmopolitan in a. a Certain, uh, in a certain uh, sense, uh, but at the same time they are still uh, really um, aware of their identity in a rather narrow way. Mm -hmm. not, uh, they are not able to avoid some uh, stereotypes. Thank you yeah. very much, Elena. And Slovakia? So this question in the previous question of Alistair about the significance of the data, so I would like to go back that in the methodology of any kind of research, it's uh, necessary to follow this idea of external validity. And I think that uh, within this conference, we could uh, get some evidence of uh, external validity of Alistair's research. For example, in the last section, there were two papers uh, which were focused on very similar topics responsibility, social responsibility, and uh, citizenship awareness. And the data were obtained by qualitative methodology, and I think that there was no big disparity in the data which were collected or obtained by Alistair qualitative methodology. And 
and uh, quantitative methodology of colleagues from Czech Republic and Hungary. So I think that uh, we can find significance of uh, data or consider as quite high. And uh, which data are like representative or important or maybe surprising for me? It's um, according uh, the, the report, I have a feeling that the national identity of Slovak people is uh, weaker than national identity of Czechs or people from Poland and Hungary. And Slovak people are more prone to declare the advantages of to be a part of uh, European Union. After I see as a big problem and a crucial problem in developing of social attitudes of the young people is uh, uh, attitudes to politics and politicians uh, because if we are living in the country with very low level of social trust and the social trust in declared is declared in the trust to the authorities who rule the countries and this level of social trust is getting to be like reproductive to the higher uh, to the lower position which, which is a very very negative element in any any kind of social development and the question for me is how it's possible to change this situation because this is a status quo mm -hmm. which is very important to know what's the identity of the young people from philosophical politological sociological point of view but it's good or bad and what is our aim and how it's necessary to reach this aim by pedagogical, psychological, or any kind of tools, tools that we are having at disposal. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Veta. And Hungary, Eva? Uh, I strongly agree uh, with uh, Iveta, uh, but uh, uh, and a lot of uh, other people. And uh, because surprisingly, uh, no, it was surprisingly for me that uh, Hungarian students have strong rejection towards Jewish Russia and uh, Turkish people. And uh, uh, it is really interesting in highlight of the things that I talked about before that they think that they they completely different than their parents and then grandparents. But uh, it seems that uh, much more rejection to Russia and uh, Ukraine and Turkish people than their parents and grandparents who have much more reason for this. They have no reason for, for this hating, but this very, very deep emotion, I think, they, they take off their other generation. Uh, it is surprising and a little bit thorough, I think. Thank very you very much. much. Thank you very much, Eva and Sveta. Uh, yes, I, I think that there were uh, similar things which surprised me also. Uh, I was surprised that these young people have uh, quite a, not a lot of knowledge about the period of socialism and communism. They were not able to describe it, or they described with things which I think are important for young generation. They said everyone had to wear the same. Uh, everything was the same, it was terrible. So this is the, the main characteristic of this time. Everything was the same. And you couldn't travel abroad. Okay, this is something also very important for young people. But on the other side, as it was said before, I was surprised of this still uh, alive aversion against Russia. Uh, we, all the people had to learn Russian. They did not like the Russian language. We need to remember that Russia is a threat and so on. And uh, another thing which surprised me was uh, this uh, the describing of the uh, positive effects of European Union. Uh, as Alistair said in one, word, uh, one sentence, they value, uh, there is instrumental positive arguments which are prevailing. Uh, better life, traveling abroad, possibility to study abroad, Euro without borders. So these are the most frequent uh, describing of uh, positive effects. 
and they merely not mentioned <coughs> human rights, freedom to speak, freedom to write, or even freedom to protest. Thank you very much, sir. And may I say something? The another question was, what is missing? I must say that I miss the difference between the, these two groups which were interviewed. Sometimes I was looking for differences between younger and older groups. It will be yes. nice to see these differences. We which, develop that much. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. And last question to the experts. Uh, this is a question about the issue Sveta uh, mentioned in her first speech. Uh, the young people were reported as constructing the nature of European uh, identity as institutional and their country identity as a pre preliminary uh, culture. Does this seem to be an issue of generational difference as young people mentioned? Suggest, or is it something more whispered across different generations? Set up. As I said already, I think it is primarily a matter about the differences between generations. Mm -hmm. Because uh, young generations, they see national identity, especially through these national, national cultural uh, uh, events and so on, but when they are thinking about Europe, they are thinking about uh, foreign country, studying abroad, uh, the tourism uh, without borders, as I said before. Uh, these are the main, maybe the main gains for them. For older generation, there is there are other values, I think, because they they know uh, uh, better the differences of difference in, in living, uh, expressing themselves uh, in former times. Okay. Thank you very much, Seta. Um, Eva, what's your hand up? I agree with Seta, and, uh, and uh, I mentioned before that uh, I think this uh, generational differences maybe missed or um, eliminated when they will be the older generation mm -hmm. because it is in, in I think it is generally the uh, differences between old generation generation <coughs> old and young people and uh, someday they will be the old people and they will be much more emotionally connected their national identities and they don't want to go abroad again, <laughs> don't want to go anywhere. They they just want to be Hungarian, Slovakian and so on and uh, and the next generation thinks that oh they are not open minded, they are just uh, nationalities, patriotism and so on. I think this is special not not a special identity problem. This is a generational intergenerational differences. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, according to uh, the idea of uh, the, the idea of identity, uh, it is uh, we know that the main uh, process in constructing uh, in, in construction of identity is the universal process of me and other. So when you know who is the other, you can describe who you are. Uh, so the main question is the, who is this other? And uh, from the data in the Polish case it was very uh, clearly seen that the, uh, like a stereotypical other is the Russians and Russia. In any context, it's a diabolic other. But they were talking, uh, when they were talking about the Belarusians and the Ukrainians, they used completely different discourse. They used the political discourse. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, Belarusia can join the European Union without Lukashenko. Mm -hmm. The political uh, uh, frame changed, and we can, we can talk about the, the changing identity. The, 
the, the identity in the minds of the, uh, of the students is not something classical, but contextual. Yeah. Which is which is a very good and, and the second uh, uh, the second important is the when the identity is construction the way they construct identity <coughs> depends on intergenerational uh, contacts and here uh, the data shows that the other for the students are the grandparents most of the uh, most of the uh, talks were the two. I am really afraid to talk to my grandfathers because I can offend them very easily. That, that means that <coughs> they lose some kind of the same language. Mm -hmm. And the most problematic uh, seems to be uh, the contact with the parents. Because they accuse their parents with in, in a hypocrisy. That they say one and doing another. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Iveta. So I, I will be very brief. It was mentioned already that uh, once you enrich your horizon, there are more factors which influence your identity. And I think that definitely a uh, younger generation due to the political changes and due to the Eurozone opportunities definitely um, is wide the horizon. So that's why there is a very intensive intergeneration change, but uh, one more thing that I remember when we started to do a research with Alistair in my country in uh, east of Slovakia, so I was surprised that generally the concept of identity as a such, or word identity, is not like uh, an active vocabulary in our context. Uh, when we ask the students what is your identity, akare tvoja identita, they didn't react because uh, it's not the concept that we are actively operating with. So we start to write, rephrase whom you feel to be, kim sa cítiš byť, alebo kto si, si chlapé, si dievča, si žena. And from this, uh, this like, uh, uh, statements, we started to focus their attention to very interesting. Thank you very much. And Helena, check. Well, uh, my opinion is a bit uh, different. In my opinion, that's a rather usual attitude to identify yourself primarily in uh, the ethnocultural sense, because our identity is ethnoculturally rooted at uh, Ankrit. Uh, we are able to change our citizenship as one of our identity levels. I mean in the sense of belonging to some particular state, but we change hardly our cultural identity. Yeah? And in my opinion, students just preserve, present their opinion, just present uh, this kind of attitude. And uh, the next argument, in the time of developing of national states, uh, the process of developing of national identity meant to simultaneously running events. First one was the developing of state formation and its institutions. And the second one was the development of nation, uh, national culture and of course the identification with uh, it. Uh, in the case of the European Union, the situation is different. The state formation has already been formed, but the awareness of common culture is in uh, progress. We talk about the necessity to preserve our cultural uh, uh, diversity as uh, we are primarily rooted in uh, our national culture. Therefore, in fact, uh, uh, even at the level of uh, um, down uh, generation, uh, at least to me, I uh, still, uh, talking about European uh, identity, I am aware of the fact that we primarily talk about the institutions, mm -hmm. about common economic area, about common political area, but 
I'm not sure we are able to talk about European culture. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elena. Thank you um, for our experts. And now I give floor to the floor. A floor to you. I would like to invite you to ask question uh, to the expert, to the particular experts, or just uh, share any comments, any thoughts you have on, on this topic we discuss. Um, I would like to know if you notice such a um, such a very specific phenomenon we did or we recognized that was constructing or being constructed, being uh, building ourselves or itself, ourself, himself as a fiction of self-ironic identity, self-ironic personality, self-ironic approach to who I am which was based on uh, linguistically constructed or linguistically embedded relationship to who I am. So it was based in the language and in the literary and drama history of the Czech, uh, of the Czech nation in the 19th century. That was very strong in, in our students who were participating in, in our pilot, <coughs> what we were doing before our, uh, before exploring or uh, designing our pedagogical approaches, we did something very tiny, tiny pilot into what it means to be European, what it means to be in Europe. And, and this, is, it is, it is a question because this is what we discovered as a very strong phenomenon. And I just wonder if you met something similar, like fictional mystification, self-irony in relationship to other people. Is this a question particular? Yes, oh yes, yeah, well, whoever. Maybe, uh, maybe be the first. Uh, I'm afraid in the case of this group that wasn't possible because they were too young. They are only 12, uh, maximum 12 or 13 years old. Yeah, they are not. Uh, their virtue is not uh, high enough. Yeah, to be ironic. At least in my. Maybe I'm not right. Uh, I think um, a little bit, uh, I don't know, if it, because you are talking about the uh, very personal uh, mirror of the identity. But uh, the research focus on a sense of group identity. And uh, uh, students answer uh, the question they, they were treated during the, uh, during the research as a, um, not as an individual, but as a representative of the opinion. So, when we uh, focus on the language, yes, we can find some kind of uh, desire uh, using the ironic language, uh, but uh, don't, that, that was not the, the main goal of this. Uh, so it's, uh, it has been, in order to answer your questions, <laughs> uh, the data had to be seen in completely different ways. So I would like to add that, according to my opinion, to reach this level of maybe linguistic expression or whatever, or also non-verbal expression, it's necessary to establish or create completely different setting. Uh, of data gathering and uh, this research uh, was uh, conducted in very, very formal situation. So I think that uh, it, it was like a predetermination, the level of connotation and denotation that the students used. Alistair? Yeah, I was thinking, as Martin knows the data best. Um, <laughs> Yes, as um, Peter was saying, this was an ex exploration of the, <coughs> the social constructions, the individual constructions. 
So the emphasis on, was on getting a group to talk together and to share a language and expression together rather than individual. I think had I done this as an interview with individuals, um, it would have caused some very different results as individuals respond in that way. Um, the, 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 what I was after was actually the, 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 um, the social construction, the genre, the languages, the um, things that are shared between the group and the individual. I didn't find any fictional um, um, responses from this particular, these, these groups of these four states. When I was in um, the Baltic states, I think there were four kids there who talked about their internet identities, which was interesting because they said, if I say I'm from Estonia or Slovakia or um, Latvia, wherever, um, on the internet, people think that I'm, say I'm a cheater, but I'm a thief. This is international. So I say I'm, um, I say I'm uh, Finnish or Swedish, and they, they simply change their national identity. It's interesting how many of them did that, and I saw the sample compared to the, the data we were given this morning of that. Um, but they, they were prepared to switch identities in that sense, of, to fictionalize themselves in that respect, to avoid those kind of questions. And the, um, the Russian, the Russo um, phone kids, the, the kids who spoke Russian, uh, Russian origin, in those, four, in those three states, um, also um, debated whether they should say they were Russian, or whether they should say they were Latvian, or say they were something else in the internet identities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for all and for your answers. And any other questions? or comments. Uh, I, I have a question to you. Uh, I, I prefer a few backup questions <laughs> for case. And now I have a question for you. What is the based on this research? How do you how can you see the uh, role of the state in the young people life in the future? Uh, we could metaphorically compare state to the house. It could be house with walls, roof, and, and basement. It could be strong family house with strong walls, with strong rooms inside. Or it could be hotel, where you can go in and every time go out. What do you think the role of the state in the future Will be this role similar to strong family house or rather to the hotel? Yes, yes, And Or maybe something in between. Yes, I think that it cannot be a hotel. You must you must have a home. And national identity is something you must have, otherwise you are lost. But national identity does not means that you feel uh, exclusively uh, as your nationality is. I was reading some paper when I was preparing for this round table in Slovenian and I uh, noticed this expression that in Slovenia they are mixing a lot of identities uh, with Czechs and uh, Hungarians here we share the common history, Austrian-Hungarian uh, history, and we have also Yugoslav identity. And now, of course, this Slovenian identity is stronger and stronger. But uh, the important thing is that this multiple identity is not something wrong. This is an advantage, and it should be a, an advantage. So, the house, but open house. Okay, thank you very much. My opinion is uh, that uh, house and open house, and uh, I, I, in, in my presentation, if uh, we have time for this idea, I will talk about that uh, the European identity is uh, built of national identity and based on it. 
because it's very similar that uh, the self-identity uh, in 